Welcome. My name is Yaniv Sagal, and I'm the acting assistant conductor of the Detroit Symphony. And I'm joined on stage today with Nick Myers, who is one of the newest members of our double bass section. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about the program. Um, but when you have a program that has such unknown works, like the Brahms Violin Concerto and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, how many people here have never heard either of these works? Okay, there you go. Uh, so it's a real masterworks kind of program. Uh, clearly, Beethoven was a big inspiration for Brahms, and in his violin concerto, uh, in Brahms' violin concerto, you hear the kind of echoes of Beethoven's violin concerto. They're in the same key, for example. Um, interestingly, Brahms' concerto was written in 1878-ish or so, so he was in his mid-40s. He was writing it around the same time as his second symphony. So if you're familiar with that second symphony sound world, it's very similar. Uh, Beethoven also was pretty late to writing his violin concertos. They're both mature works. This, this violin concerto is not like um, a Paganini violin concerto. It's certainly extremely difficult. And uh, the violin solist tonight, Christian Tetzlaff, is one of the world's top violinists, so he brings it all uh, for this concerto. Uh, but people have said about this work that it's not so much for violin and orchestra as much as orchestra against the violin. Uh, and it's a very thick orchestral part. It's a symphony, basically, where the violin solo has an important part to play, but it's symphonic in its outlook. Christian has a very, um, I, don't, I don't want to say unique, but it is a unique approach to this work. He is not afraid of taking risks and of playing so softly that you might have to lean forward to hear him, but he's playing, or to bring out not just the serene and beautiful lyric aspects of the violin, but also the dramatic and aggressive parts. So he brings it all to this to, the, to this performance, uh, it's, a very, it's a very exciting performance. And on the second half, of course, is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, he wrote this uh, in the early 1800s, took him about four years to finish it. In the meantime, he wrote several other works, um, his Fourth Symphony, his Sixth Symphony, uh, Fidelio, uh, and uh, he was already struggling with deafness in 1803, I think, is when he penned the letter that which we now know as the Heiligenstadt test, uh, testimony, which was a letter he wrote to his brother, which he never sent, in which he um, basically contemplates suicide as his impending deafness is forcing him to withdraw from the world. And he ends up, of course, not killing himself, thankfully. And uh, he comes to the realization that he must live for his art. Um, and so this period of his music is extremely dramatic and stormy, um, as of course is evident in the very opening notes of this symphony. Musicologically, is that a word? Okay. Uh, it, the work also kind of continues this trend that Beethoven had of using the symphony or t turning the symphony into some highest uh, artistic achievement. Because until this point, the symphony wasn't really a cohesive composition. <clears throat> in concerts, you might have a movement of a symphony, followed by some songs, followed by some chamber music, followed by whatever, and then maybe another movement of the symphony to end, and maybe they skip the trio and the minuet entirely. And with a work like this symphony, Beethoven says that's no longer possible. Each of the movements contains some element that's related to this opening theme of three repeated notes. He forces you to make the symphony whole by connecting the third and the fourth movement. This is the first time that has happened in the symphonic repertoire. Now, of course, anything goes in a symphony. A symphony could be one movement, it could be two movements, it could be seven movements. Um, but at this time, there were these conventions for what a symphony was, and Beethoven is turning that upside down. He's creating a narrative that takes you from the beginning to the end, as in, as, uh, for another example in this piece, 
the opening in this stormy key of C minor, which of course resolves into that glorious C major in the finale. And then in the finale itself, there's some reference to some earlier music. So he's creating a, a new arc. He's using elements throughout um, that are, that are uh, consistent. He's also expanding the orchestra because uh, for maybe not the first time, uh, but pretty rarely, there's a piccolo in the last movement, a contrabassoon, and three trombones, which don't really have a place in the symphonic repertoire until this point. They were, they were primarily used for uh, spiritual music and accompanying uh, voices in choruses and in, in the opera. So it's a very bold piece uh, from its dramatic statements, from its content, uh, from, of course, Beethoven's incredible, incredible control of harmonic tension and pacing and dynamic contrasts, and, of course, the beautiful notes that we know to be Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So that was a whirlwind tour of our concert. Thank you for sitting here patiently with me. Uh, and so now I, I'll have the pleasure to talk with, you, with Nick uh, and welcome him to the DSO family. Uh, and, uh, well, why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and uh, how you came to be in this orchestra. Sure. Um, so my name is Nick Myers. I'm from Cadillac, Michigan, which is um, up north, uh, about 45 minutes south of Traverse City. Um, and I grew up in a largely um, rural community. Um, and there's like a sign uh, about a mile from my house that says Bear Crossing next seven miles. And, you know, we see them every, every summer running through our yard. Um, and we didn't... Music is important in, in Cadillac, but um, it's not the centerpiece of the community. Um, so... That's football, right? Oh, certainly. Okay. Or basketball, oh, basketball. Or hockey. <laughs> It's a sports town. Um, so I guess my foray into music sort of happened in the public school uh, strings program. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have one and not just a band. And, you know, I, I picked up the double bass and thought, you know, this is really great and, and I like this, but, you know, it was sort of this far off thing that I, I never even dreamed that I could become a professional musician one day. Um, it was more of a slow burn of interest. and. Um, I went to Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp uh, when I was younger, and all of a sudden I, I met these um, kids just like me. And all of a sudden it was like that social group just kind of clicked. It was like, oh, they have the same ambitions, the same passions um, and interests, and it, it just worked so well. Um, so shortly after attending um, Blue Lake in the summers, I um, enrolled at Interlochen Arts Academy, um, which is relatively local for me, and spent my last two years of high school there, and did the conservatory route, started taking auditions, and was um, fortunate enough to be able to um, secure this job last fall. All right, so one takeaway is how important, of course, music is in high school to, to give you that opportunity. Now, how did you come to choose the double bass? Were you, okay, you're tall. so. Uh, did you start out with cello, or um, is, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, with a violin, my kid is four years old, so we've got a violin like this big. Um, do double basses come in smaller sizes? They do. I didn't need one. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what actually happened was, it's funny you mentioned the cello, because there's a company, Marshall Music, which operates in, um, you know, mid-Michigan and, and western Michigan, um, and the man came uh, to my house before my sixth grade year in a van full of instruments. I mean, wind instruments, percussion instruments, string instruments, everything. And so he did some um, aptitude testing and he said, you know, you've got a pretty good ear for pitch. Um, why don't we try you on either the trombone or the cello? And I thought, okay. So I picked cello thinking that that was the sound that I was always hearing in music that I really loved. Then I got to middle school, and I see in the orchestra room, what's that thing over there in the corner that nobody's looking at or touching right now? And I knew that that was actually the double bass that, that I really wanted to play. And, you know, poor families that have kids who either want to play the double bass or the harp because you have to change your vehicle, right? You can't strap it to the top. No. Um, so, uh, and did you go to school in-state for college? No, I ended up... Um, going out to Boston to New England Conservatory. Um, so I was studying with some of the members of the Boston Symphony. 
full time. Um, so I, I spent four years there for my, my undergraduate degree, and then I followed that up with two years at um, the Juilliard School with um, Hal Robinson, who's the principal of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and Rex Serrani, who's the principal of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Wow, and is this your first job? This is my first job. Wow, yeah. bravo. So, um, in, in the Beethoven tonight, there is a passage in the third movement which is notoriously difficult for cello and bass, and they play in unison. And you can only imagine, um, it's difficult by today's standards, uh, that at the premiere of this symphony, it was premiered on a cold winter night, like today, except the concert was four hours long. Uh, it actually, the concert started with, I think, the premiere of Beethoven's sixth symphony, followed by a whole bunch of pieces, and then on the second half, this opened the concert, and the poor musicians had one rehearsal beforehand. Uh, it it did, was not a very successful premiere. Um, but this excerpt, of course, is now famous because I imagine it's one of the things you had to practice in order to get in here, right? Certainly. Yeah. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about like, the audition? How, do you know roughly how many people applied for your position? Or we could guess, I bet. Maybe. 75? Maybe 75. So. I, I would guess twice as many. Maybe but more. Maybe yeah. that's when, you, when there's a violin audition, if you, get up, you can get upward of 200 applications. So, but they all fit inside of one double bass. Uh, um, so you get the audition. You have a list of things to prepare. What's, what might be on that list? So um, like you were saying, excerpts from the symphonic repertoire, things like this that are played so frequently, and it's so important that you, um, you know, hire a musician that's capable of performing these, these difficult passages. Now, what, um, sorry, excerpts meaning little snippets, right, from the pieces. Um, and of course, the double bass is not usually a featured solo instrument inside the orchestra. So are these phrases or passages that we would really know if you kind of are a layperson, or are they kind of buried inside of an orchestra? They're generally buried. Um, the, the Beethoven one, of course, is the outlier, because nothing else is happening except for that. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly, I guess, you know, with, with Beethoven 9, um, frequently asked is the, the recitatives at the very beginning of the, the last movement. Um, there might be also a, Mahler. Uh, Mahler's Mahler first solo, symphony. Yeah. There's a, there's a, in, the, in Mahler's first symphony, there is um, a great uh, Freda Jaca in the minor key for solo bass. Uh, <laughs> so that, that could be one, right? Yeah. Or perhaps, um, like as you were saying with the unisons, um, like the first movement of the Mozart um, 35th, the, the Hofner symphony, um, which is a unison passage as well that you would, you would hear. Okay, so you have a list of. 15, 20 excerpts, perhaps? Something like that, yeah. Uh, maybe something solo or Bach? Both, both. Both, yes. Like a concerto? Yeah, and I happen to perform the uh, Kusevitsky concerto. You may recognize that name because he was the music director of the Boston Symphony for, geez, like 40 years, I think. Um, and a bassist. And a bass player, so. But when you play a concerto, usually you're playing different string tunings and different instrument, right? Yes, so it's, it's actually challenging. It's, it's funny you bring that up because um, the setup for the instrument is, is very, very different when you're playing in the orchestra because you need to be able to actually put out a lot of sound um, without making a lot of noise. Um, and you have to sort of like be able to like, it's more like power. Whereas with solo music, um, you're looking for agility and sensitivity. And um, so you would, you would use you know, thinner gauge strings, which are tuned higher so that they project a little more and so that they're a little more melodic sounding as opposed to harmonic and rhythmic. So then, sense? so just to put this also in context, when you, when you play an audition, you played it on the stage, right? Yes. But when you walked out, you probably walked out on a carpet uh, and there were curtains right up here. So out in the audience, the committee cannot see who is auditioning and cannot hear if they're wearing high heels or not, because um, that would come up. So it's, you're coming out here, and you can see the beautiful ceiling, and that's about it, right? Yeah. And you're playing into a curtain and thinking, OK, there's some people out there judging every single note. Now, did you bring two instruments then for the different setup, or you have to figure it out? No, you have to figure it out. So you, can, you, you want to curate. You know that you have to play all these excerpts, and you have to make it sound like you're an old hand playing in orchestras your whole life. 
Um, and so you curate the, you have choices of what Bach movement you want to play and what concerto you want to play. And in fact, I actually auditioned for this orchestra twice. And the first time I made semifinals, uh, and then I was asked to play my, um, my concerto, and I chose a much more difficult concerto that's more uh, Italian and uh, showy. And it, it was just like, with my setup at the time, I just, it lent itself well to mishaps, which happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I was cut, and I was, I was pretty disappointed. Um, and so the second time around, I thought, okay, how do I avoid this? And so I chose some different stuff that would lay a little better with what I was um, using at the time, you know, for, for orchestral stuff. Um, and luckily enough, it, it did. <laughs> See, I mean, you, you live in, and learn. I, I can share a, a nice story of my mother's orchestral audition. My mother played in the New York Philharmonic for 40 years. And um, when she joined in, I think, 72, uh, and just in the history of orchestras, that made her the sixth woman to get tenure in the New York Phil. Um, so she came to her audition, and at the time, they didn't actually release these uh, list of excerpts ahead of time. Uh, they were considered sight reading. Put, put the thing in front of them, and they had to play them and see how it was going. And it was one to see how they sight read, because uh, that was a much bigger tradition in a way. I think people weren't used to taking the material home and preparing, they had to read it down. Um, but also, the purpose of, of the sight reading was actually to determine whether the musician had had the experience of playing in an orchestra before. Because some, some of these orchestral excerpts are pretty much impossible to sight read. Um, so there was one excerpt which involved a lot of string crossing, like, you know, going rapidly from one position to another with this hand, while this hand's doing all sorts of uh, quick notes. And um, she crashed and burned. And she didn't advance. And she was so mad at herself for not being able to sight read that, that passage. So she went to the New York Public Library uh, and found the passage and learned it. And about six months later, the personnel manager called her and said, we still have an opening, and we would like you to come back and audition again. And guess what they put in front of her? That same passage. And she nailed it. And she got into the orchestra. Uh, so that's exactly, it sounds like, what you did. You, 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 you learned from your experience um, and adapted and came in and showed what you could do. So what was the concerto the second time? That was, that was the Kusevitsky. The Kusevitsky. The, the, the time, first yeah. time was Buzzoni? The, the Bottasini. Bottasini. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a weird piece. <laughs> yeah. Really not very good music. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, is, is there any sort of, do you have to play along with anybody else in the section? Or was it all completely blind? And then so they say, congratulations, you won. It was completely blind. Um, and they actually offered me a, a trial period. It was just me and this other guy that were in the finals. We were you know, kind of sweating it out back in the, in the musician's lounge. And, you know, our personnel manager came in and said, um, you know, congratulations, you both played really excellently. Um, but the committee would like to extend a, a trial week to Nick. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, so at this point, you've been subbing with the orchestra, right? No, that was, oh, this that was the first one. Yeah, so I didn't even consider it a possibility. Um, and so she brought me in um, on the other side of the curtain this time and she introduced me to my future colleagues, and it was just this like surreal experience because I knew from then on that my life had changed. You know, no longer was I just a student, you know, striving for this this sort of exterior or external validation. It was like, whoa, like I have the opportunity to play in this really fantastic ensemble, and like this thing that I've been working for for so long um, is actually going to come to fruition. So it was, it was a really um, rewarding but bizarre experience. <laughs> um, and then, so trial week would be when you get invited to play in the section. Then did you sit up or stand or, I don't know if you sit or for you, when you play. Sit, yeah. You sit. Um, did you sit up front with, uh, with Kevin, with the principal? Yeah. Uh, and that, the purpose of the trial week was basically like, okay, let's see how you really do. You know, when, when you're playing with, with musicians, you know, how do you... Um, how do you listen in the ensemble to other sections? How do you, how do you fit in with this section specifically? Um, and also more than that, you know, 
are you a decent guy? Like, are you, <laughs> are you hard to work with on a personal level? Like, are you, you know, fun to be around? So. so let's talk about some of the challenges then of playing the double bass inside of an orchestra. We have 80 people on stage. Uh, the instrument itself uh, is not easy to play. You know, with such big strings, there, where you put your finger can, to get the intonation right, is you've got like a very wide target to hit. Yeah. Uh, the response of the in instrument is slower because of the vibration of the string uh, than, say, the violins. And somehow, you have to play together with not just your eight colleagues in your section, but blend with people all the way on the other side of the stage. So what are some of the challenges you, you discover there, or how do we work around that hmm. in your first year? In my first year, <laughs> um, it's, it's been, you know, of course, it's been a balance between, um, you know, I know that they, they, they did choose me out of the audition for a reason, um, and so I think they, they heard my musical ideas and they, they enjoyed them enough to say, yeah, we want to, you know, we want to invest in this, this candidate. Um, so it's, it's been interesting um, being a section player, someone that, that has to fit into a, a specific established sound already, um, saying like, okay, well, you know, maybe I wouldn't do this this way if I was just playing on my own or like preparing for an audition. Um, but also maintaining my own character, which I think is important to, to come through to the audience as well, so that we as musicians can um, portray the most genuine performance possible for, for the audience members, um, because that's what makes live music and orchestral music specifically special, and hopefully that's why you're here. Um, and so that's been sort of a, a challenge, um, but I would say that optimistically, it hasn't been like a, a negative challenge. It's been like, wow, this is cool. And you can learn so much from, from your colleagues, not only in your section, but also around the orchestra um, or in front of the orchestra, as, as we're hearing this week with, with Tetzloff. I mean, he's, I've looked up to him since I was a very young musician. And to finally like, be able to share a stage with him is incredible. And you notice a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise notice just listening to the recordings. So. Um, in just a few minutes, if, if you're thinking about any questions you might have about the concert or, or for Nick, please, um, I'll, I'll open up the floor. I usually wait till the end and then it takes like a minute. So I, I figured I'd give that warning. Um, let me just ask you a few more things about, about the instrument. If you look at the, um, the bases, uh, you'll notice that some of them, well, there are a lot of different say, sizes and shapes. Uh, and in Europe, they might have five strings. Uh, and here we tend to have four string basses, but then there's kind of like this extra piece that's jutting out uh, past what's called the scroll of, of uh, past the neck and scroll of the instrument. And, and what's that? So that's what's referred to as an extension. And it's actually sort of wild. It's like this Frankenstein addition to our instrument. But um, to be the reason why we call it the double bass is because Oftentimes, in earlier music, we were used to literally double the bass. So we would play one octave below the cello. So the cellos were the bass. Um, and that was just to like give more um, oomph. oomph. Yeah, more. That's a technical term. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, unfortunately, though, with, with the double bass as it's tuned um, in, in standard, it's, it only goes down to a low E, whereas the cello can go down to a low C. And so the solution that we use in this country is to affix an extension to the scroll, which actually adds extra fingerboard up past um, where the regular fingerboard would end. And there's a longer string that goes all the way around, and it comes around the scroll, and then it attaches to the peg. And then there's four little um, capos, similar to what you would use um, on a guitar, that stop off the string. And so you can open up each capo, E, E flat, D, D flat, C. And so then you can actually double the bass. So it's a full octave below what a cello is capable of playing. So, you could, so in other words, you could stop it, and then it would be an E, and that's like normal open string, or you could open it up and get all the way down. Yeah, cool. And we actually do listen closely and maybe watch. In the last movement of, um, of, of the Beethoven Symphony we're performing tonight, there's a lot of low Cs. And, and actually, <laughs> the instruments in Beethoven's time may or may not have even been able to play those. So one of the choices that sections and conductors or principals make today is when do we want to use that low sound and when do we want to lighten it up a little bit and not go down the full octave. Yeah.
Okay, so we've got about five minutes left. So if there are any questions for Nick, yes, please. Do you know, I'll have to repeat the question, um, are you familiar with some of the jazz history in Detroit, uh, especially uh, bassist Ron Carter? I, I do know of Ron Carter. Um, he actually, he taught at Juilliard. He's, I knew him as um, more of a New York jazz bass player, so I don't, I don't actually, I'm not familiar with his relation to Detroit, but... Um, how, how is jazz bass different from classical bass? Oh, um, so, so jazz bass is... Uh, much more improvisatory, and you know, a lot of times you don't use the bow at all. Um, primarily, if you're playing a walking bass line, you're going to be just um, plucking it with your fingers, um, and it's it's um, more of a rhythmic thing. It's like a driving rhythm, which keeps it provides a framework for the other instruments in, in a jazz ensemble to um, play melodies or solos against. So it just contextualizes things harmonically. Is the um is the fingering for an upright bass the same as an electric bass, or can it be? It can be, and it's tuned in the same way, although because it's just a much smaller instrument, um, you'll see that, you know, if you, if you watch the bass section, we never really use the third finger like, like cellists and upper string players use, just because the scale of the instrument is so large that you have to, you know, use one and four a lot. It's really primitive. Um, but with, with bass guitar, um, the strings are much shorter, so you can actually put like one finger per fret, which is kind of cool. So it's um, more accessible, I would say. Okay, cool. Uh, do we have any more questions about? Yes. So we're, the question is about string sound and changing strings. So um, one thing we talked about was the setup for a concerto, right? In, uh, yeah. in, yeah. For a concerto, that's when you completely change everything. But for an or, in an orchestra, you're, you're not changing the setup on a nightly basis, and your strings are really expensive. Yeah, I actually just purchased strings. I got a great deal. They were only $240 for a set. For a set of strings, which will last how long? <laughs> Uh, I pushed mine to about a year, oh. <laughs> um, but I was a broke college kid last year, so... Now you can, now you can afford it. Yeah. Um, as a violinist, uh, you change your strings a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, and what about bow rehairs? Um, you know, the, 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 the hair on a, on a bow is made from horse hair, mm -hmm. and we have to get those changed pretty regularly? Yeah, every, I mean, depending on how much you're playing, every couple months, usually. Um, with bass bows, it's, it's usually, there's just more hair. It's just a much bulkier, larger object. So there's more hair, and it does tend to last a little longer, I think. OK. And, and also, you know, basses are, are in, in, in the orchestral world, even if they have the same line as um, the cellos, they might not even do the same bowings, mm -hmm. uh, because where they get the response in the bow and from the instrument, a lot of things work better at the frog, yeah. and um, that, that concern of projection um, and and response from the instrument is kind of the primary uh, objective in many times, right? Certainly, yeah. Um, so th there's a lot. There's a very big difference to playing um, playing the double bass. Another thing also is that the, you'll notice on stage uh, tonight the the double bass has two different bow holds. Um, so there's the French hold, which is essentially it looks, looks like exactly, the violin, yeah, yeah. or cello. Um, and what what I do, which is different and primitive, um, is I use the German hold, which actually comes from the gamba tradition, if, if that means anything to anybody. So instead of holding it over the stick, it's got a much larger um, frog, which is what holds the hair on the bow, and you hold it underneath um, the stick, and you, you kind of draw it like this. Um, and it, I think what drew me to it is I, I was able to, to use a lot more just natural arm weight, and um, like you said, just dig into the string and, and provide that low um, support that, that every orchestra needs. All right, well, thank you so much, Nick. Thank, thank you. you for coming. We hope you enjoy tonight's program.